Spider-Man. He gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, catching bad guys. Who wouldn't want to have his awesome powers? From spider strength and spider speed. Very fast. To web shooting. He can shoot much further than I ever would have imagined it. And the ability to defy gravity. This high-flying hero's got all the moves. But how do Spider-Man's powers hold up against scientific fact? Which of his skills are spun from a web of pure fantasy? And which are really possible in our world? This is one thing where the science really lines up well with what Spider-Man is doing. The answers are just ahead as we unravel the secrets of Spider-Man tech. From comic books, to TV shows, to movie screens. Spider-Man, the Marvel Comics creation of Stan Lee and Steve Ditko, has spun his way into our pop culture consciousness. And after more than 40 years, this climbing, swinging, acrobatic webmaster is bigger and better than ever. Spider-Man's powers are based on the abilities of the eight-legged creatures many believe are insects. But they're not. Spiders are a separate class of animals known as arachnids. Insects are characterized by having six legs, they have antennae, they have three body segments. Spiders, on the other hand, have two body segments. They also have eight legs, like all arachnids. There are several other differences also, but those are the, the most noticeable differences. Spider-Man doesn't have eight legs, but the arachnid abilities he does have are more than enough to help put criminals in their place. Here's your change! But Spider-Man's amazing superpowers don't make life any simpler for his humble alter ego. Peter Parker, struggling student, fledgling photographer for the Daily Bugle. Don't make me look ugly. <laughs> That's impossible. And love-struck protector of the beautiful MJ Watson. Ah, perfect. He's really just a regular guy. Most anybody can empathize with him. He could be you or me or any fellow, really. Now, when creating a superhero, the most important thing is you have to figure out, how do I give him a superpower? The answer can be found by traveling back to 1962, a time when anxiety swept the globe as tensions boiled between the United States and the Soviet Union. The fears of nuclear war and radioactive fallout were everywhere. Spider-Man came out of the concerns of the era, specifically concerns about the bomb, radioactivity. This was the sort of new magic buzzword. And there was an uncertainty. People didn't really understand what radiation could do. And when you're uncertain about something, you get scared of it. Radiation essentially always does damage to cells. It's always a negative effect. The key element is the dosage. In low enough dosage, you're not gonna do sufficient damage. High dosages start causing damage. Radiation was very much in the news at the time. And I figured, well, let's let Spider-Man get his power through radiation. And if he's gonna have spider power, what could be simpler than a, a radioactive spider bites him? In the comics, Spider-Man was born the day Peter Parker took a fateful trip to a science exhibit and watched a demonstration of radioactivity. During the demo, along came a spider that had been zapped by atomic radiation which the spider passed on to Peter with a single venom-packed bite to his hand. And that enhances him somehow uh, with these incredible spider-like powers. And, and from there uh, was born a great hero. I figured you radiate a spider, the spider bites a person, he becomes like a spider. Nobody can argue with that. Well, almost nobody. Over the years, people have wondered just how much of this famous origin story holds up under a microscope. In the comic book version, the radioactive spider, well, that radiation wouldn't really last too long, and it would be hard to see how that would have a permanent effect on the venom. When a spider bites a human, it is unlikely that there's any transfer in radioactive activity. The mass of the spider is extremely small, and relative to our size, the radiation exposure is uh, probably less than that of walking by a television set. Okay, so it's doubtful a bite from a radioactive spider could turn a nerdy teen into an athletic superhero. 
But what other explanation could there be for Peter Parker's spidery transformation? The answer may lie in the fast-changing science of genetic engineering. Simply put, genetic engineering involves putting two pieces of DNA from different organisms together, combining genes for the purposes of making new sorts of organisms. And people have been working on that for all kinds of applied technologies, which involve introducing a foreign gene to animals for the purposes of improving the domestic line of animals. There are over 32,000 known species of spider in the world. Genetic manipulation was exactly what Spider-Man got for the movies. In 2002, director Sam Raimi decided that the superhero's origin story needed a fresh spin. So this time, that renegade spider didn't just carry radiation in his fangs. This antagonistic arachnid was a genetically engineered super spider, a scientific fusion of multiple species. It's an entirely new genome combining the genetic information from all three spiders into these 15 genetically designed super spiders. Every organism has a genome, and for a spider, a spider genome would be the genetic code that the spider possesses that gives basically the genetic blueprints for every aspect of that spider's life. In the movie, those genomes become mixed with each other to try to create these genetically engineered super spiders that are composites of, you know, taking the best qualities, the most impressive qualities of the different species. Hey, look at that spider. This grass spider hunts using a set of reflexes so fast that some researchers believe it almost borders on precognition, a spider sense. Spiders are able to climb walls. They can create elaborate web patterns for trapping mechanism. Some spiders, like the jumping spiders, can leap at least 40 times their own body length. Some of them are extremely good visual hunters. The others perceive their whole world through vibration, and spiders are usually fairly strong for what they are. In a movie, we took some of these attributes and adapted them to this particular spider that beat Peter Parker. By setting up the field based on science, it was believable enough to say that yeah, this can happen. The bite of the spider transforms Peter by combining the spider's DNA with Peter Parker's DNA into a human with these spider-like attributes. But could it really happen? Parker, let's do it. Could a man be genetically altered to take on the characteristics of a spider? A lot of genetically modified animals have, have been created for various purposes to produce all kinds of strange effects. Mice that glow are one of the stranger results of genetic engineering. This man-made breed of mouse carries in its DNA the genes from a bioluminescent jellyfish. Basically what you can do is while the ova, the fertilized ova, are dividing, you can inject in a fluorescent protein that has been taken, the gene for it's been taken out of a jellyfish that's fluorescent. You inject it in, and then as the cells divide, all the cells then contain this gene. And if you shine a fluorescent light on it, it glows. Transferring traits from one animal to another at the stage of inception is one thing. But how could it be possible to genetically modify a nearly grown man like Peter Parker? One way it might happen is if the spider that bit Peter carried a retrovirus in its venom. A retrovirus is a virus that is particularly insidious. What they do is the virus invades a host cell and then the genetic material of that virus becomes incorporated into the host genome. An example of a retrovirus would be HIV. When a person becomes infected with HIV, the genes from the HIV virus actually become incorporated into a person. And so if Peter Parker, with his actual human genome were to be mutated by a spider bite, then you know somehow spider genes would have to get into his genome, possibly by something like a retrovirus. Weird. Viruses can move across species, and there's evidence to show that a certain fraction of our genomes, human genomes, are basically remnants of viruses. So it's sort of plausible that the genetic information from the spider could get inserted into 
Peter Parker. So let's say a virus containing the codes for certain spider traits got inserted into Peter Parker's DNA. How could that information alone enable him to climb, spin webs, and have the proportional strength of a spider? According to experts, the virus would also have to be engineered to transform Peter's physiology, the way his body systems work, including his glands, nerves, and muscles. The effects that we see in Peter Parker could only happen if there was a profound and significant change in the genetic expression. This virus would have to affect the genetic expression virtually of his whole body and not simply a few organ systems. And through this change, then we could see the things that Peter Parker does. But whether his powers are the result of radiation or a genetic manipulation, it's clear that Spider-Man took what he got from his namesake and ran with it, using his talents for tasks that surpass anything a spider could do. But of all his skills, there's one Spidey counts on more than any other, one that gives the superhero an advantage over all the rest. One of Spider-Man's greatest crime-fighting tools is a power that he literally keeps up his sleeves. That's been a, a real staple of Spider-Man is, is the thwip thwip, that, that sort of become like an iconic kind of gesture uh, that people immediately know that's Spider-Man. The ability to sling web lines for speedy transportation and for self-defense may be this superhero's greatest trademark. And it's one rooted in the web-making abilities of real arachnids. Webs are made from spider silk, an extremely fine yet strong fiber, which comes from spinnerets on a spider's abdomen. The majority of spiders have th uh, three pair of spinnerets. Tarantulas and such have, have two. On the tarantula, she doesn't have the spinnerets down now, but the spinnerets are on the tail end of the abdomen. Basically, the silk comes out of any one of those spinnerets. And there's all sorts of musculature uh, associated with those spinnerets that can make them move in all sorts of directions so they can put silk precisely where they want to. But how could a human like Peter Parker spin silk spider style? In the original comics, his web spinning was the result of technological ingenuity. A brilliant amateur inventor, Peter created a quick hardening liquid that he stored in twin devices worn on his wrists. I think it might have been Steve Ditko, the artist who came up with the idea of him shooting webs. I couldn't imagine that anybody would believe that he could really shoot webs like a spider. So I had him wear web shooters. These arm-mounted web shooters are filled with the compact fluid and he presses a button that's on his palm and he shoots these things out. One of the things that we have now that's a lot like his self-made web slingers are the party strings that come in the aerosol cans. Inside the canister, you have a gas to provide the pressure, and you have a liquid mixture, soap, and a polymer. And the soap provides a foaming agent so that when the string comes out, it's a foam encased with a nice polymer coating to give it some hardness. But if Spider-Man's gonna use his small man-made web slingers, in the end, his web slingers probably cannot store the amount of material that you really see used over and over in the comics. This is why I think in the movies where the web slingers are built into him genetically is the best bet that he has. For the 2002 movie, Spidey's web slinging tactics got a more organic update. In the movies, Spider-Man has a gland in his arm which contains the material from which spider webs are made. Uh, he's got muscles around that gland that are capable of increasing the pressure. He's got an opening where when that pressure builds up enough, the material shoots out. And he can shoot the webbing much further than I ever would have imagined it. And it looks so great. I wish I had thought of that when I first started the strip. On the first movie, we did consider the chemistry behind the webs. The basic idea is when he fires the webs, it is a combination of two fluids that when they hit the oxygen in the air, they solidify and then he's got some kind of biological mechanism in his wrist that can propel that to whatever distance he needs. But what physical changes would have to occur in a real person to allow them to make spider webs? 
first, they'd have to be able to produce fibroin, the unique liquid protein that spider silk is made from. And thanks to geneticists in Canada, that arachnid talent is actually within the realm of possibility. In 2002, scientists at Nexia Biotechnologies created genetically modified goats that could produce fibroin protein molecules in their milk glands. Nexia has taken particular parts of spider dragline silk genes and they've inserted them into goats so that would only be expressed in the mammary glands of the goat. That means you can go and milk the goat and mixed in with the goat's milk will be silk molecules. So then the silk molecules get separated from the, the rest of the milk. It's like little Miss Muffet sitting on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. You're separating curds, whey, and now spider silk. And once collected, you could separate out the spider silk, then artificially spin it into a medical suture. You could use spider silk molecules in ways that spiders never evolved to use them. So in theory, Peter Parker's body could produce spider silk protein molecules. But how could he spin the protein into a fiber and then shoot it from his wrists? Real spiders use their spinnerets in the silk making process. But creating similar organs in a human sounds like a pretty tall order. Or does it? Now it is possible if Peter Parker was bitten and a virus was somehow able to code for the development of a spinneret in the wrists, and that the adjacent cells were not hostile to this growth. Then, Peter Parker would be at liberty to develop these spinnerets, shoot them. I mean, there are no holds barred then. But inserting one new gene is not going to be enough for something so complicated as a spinneret that would be put into a large mammal. You'd have to bring in thousands and thousands of genes, and you could put them in locally. You could theoretically take antler genes from a deer. Take those antler genes and inject it into your hand. And if you had the, all, the right combination of genes to change what's being made there, you could grow a horn out and it could come off every year. This is theoretically very possible. And so you can kind of get what you want. You just have to have the will and the resources to make these new little organelles and organs and, and tissues. Spider-Man's a sharpshooter when it comes to slinging his webs. But real spiders don't actually have that fine-tuned ability. They really don't shoot webs. They don't really have a way to actually physically squeeze the silk out. Basically, they attach it someplace, and the spider can take a pair of legs, usually the hind legs, and physically pull it from the spinnerets and then, uh, then attach it to another strand of silk. But with the right musculature, it might be possible to sling webs. Humans already have such muscles, though not in their wrists. I'm sure everybody has been in the situation where they've been really hungry and they go to take a bite of the pizza and all of a sudden some saliva comes shooting out. Well, there's a case where there are muscles in there that will actually help eject it, a pressure head that comes out. But there's more to Spider-Man's web slinging than just how he does it. Give the guy credit for the sheer, impressive range of web work he pulls off, something no single spider species can do. Originally, Spidey just shot a web. Later on, we figured in drawing the strip, why couldn't he actually create a spider web? So Steve would draw little webs where Spider-Man would tie people up with his webbing or trap them within the webbing. Besides Spider-Man's classic bungee-style webs, he's also got a knack for spinning web balls, those globby silk bombs good for knocking out a fast-moving crook. As for the amount of research we did with scientists, you know, the web balls, not so much. It was kind of a little made-up attribute. Spider-Man's also known to spin an elegant orb web, perfect for an intimate conversation with MJ. I think I always knew, all this time, who you really were. But there's another amazing aspect to Spider-Man's webs. Their incredible strength. It's a quality that's not only fantastic, Whoa! 
it's also surprisingly plausible. Guys, no playing in the streets. Yes, Mr. Spider-Man. See ya. We know that Spider-Man doesn't just shoot webs to shorten his daily commute. He often uses webbing as tools of astonishing power. Case in point, this heart-pounding sequence from Spider-Man 2, in which our hero tries to stop a runaway train using only the strength of his silk. He's on the front of the speeding train, and the train is about to come to a point where the tracks end and everybody will be killed. Tell everyone to hang on! This is an excellent example of good physics at work. Spider-Man and his webs are strong enough in principle to stop the train, but he has to attach his web to a material, in this case the buildings along the side of the train. The train is racing forward. The webbing gets taut. Will it hold? Won't it hold? The buildings aren't able to support the forces being generated, so Spider-Man comes up with the only real solution he can use in this case, which is to use as many webs as possible. The total force doesn't change, but by using more webs, the force on each part of the wall is much smaller, and the wall can now support the force. at the last minute, it should come as no surprise to you, it held. Okay, so the science in this scene is believable, but could spider webs really be strong enough to stop a speeding train? As we know, spiders use silk to spin their webs, but not all spider silk is the same. Dragline silk, the kind spiders make to hang from ceilings, and the kind Spider-Man uses to swing from buildings, is the strongest silk. In fact, spider dragline is so strong, proportionally, it's tougher than steel. That's right, steel. It really is one of the materials that is both extremely strong, many times stronger than steel, but also highly flexible. This is one thing where the science really lines up well with what Spider-Man is doing. But what makes dragline silk so incredibly tough and elastic? The answer can be found in its unique molecular makeup. Dragline silk has, within the protein molecule, different subunits, crystalline-like structures and a spring-like structure. And it's the combination of those two regions which are thought to give dragline silk its superior toughness. Some strands of spider silk are just a tenth as thick as a human hair, or about one one-hundredth of a millimeter but they can snag an insect flying 15 miles an hour into a web without it breaking. So if real spider silk can be that strong, it's plausible to imagine Spider-Man's proportionally larger web lines carrying the weight of his body. In order to support Spider-Man's weight during that swing, the thread would have to be at least half a millimeter in thickness. If it were any thinner than that, it would break. If it were thicker than that, he'd be wasting material every time he formed a web. Considering what we know of the webbing, swinging through the streets the way Spider-Man does, um, the webbing would hold, and he could have substantially greater weight on there. In terms of actual physics, Spider-Man swinging on the web does work. Mechanical engineers have done studies to show that the silk would be more than strong enough to support Peter Parker and three or four other people as he swings through the canyons of New York. People have speculated that it'll be possible, given the physics of a single spider silk fiber, that if we could scale this up into a thick cable, at least an inch in diameter, we could even stop a fighter jet. So for Spider-Man, it's fair to say that using webs to catch a falling police car is within the realm of possibility. It's a web. Go, Spidey, go! But spinning sturdy webs isn't the only way Spider-Man shows his incredible strength. Ah! 
Spider-Man can lift objects more than 50 times his own body weight. In the same way that some real spiders can lift objects up to 50 times heavier than they are. Hi. Hi. He does have enhanced strength, so can he lift a car over his head? Yes. Is it easy to do? No, not at all. This is really heavy. He feels the physical pain and strain. Spiders have a remarkable range of abilities to lift weights. So some spiders seem to be pretty wimpy. Other spiders seem to be remarkably strong. With silk, it can wrap up a large cricket in its web and it can haul it up or back to its hiding place. Their body structure enables them to do things that we as humans or mammals, most mammals could not even think of duplicating. I thought Spider-Man would have the proportionate strength of a spider. In other words, if a spider were as large as a human being, that's how strong the spider would be, which made Peter Parker very strong. Ironically, Spider-Man's body doesn't appear to be physically different than ours. Except for his suit, he looks pretty much like any other guy who's good about getting to the gym. So what would allow Spider-Man to be as strong as he is without having a physique more like, say, the Incredible Hulk? It is possible that the virus introduced into Peter Parker could have a selective impact on muscle fibers. This virus could somehow change the expression of muscle tissue in the human body to produce more actin and myosin, the contractile proteins of muscle. If you have more contractile proteins, then your muscular strength would be enhanced. Or maybe Spider-Man's body has extra endorphins, those pain-killing molecules that help humans perform incredible acts of strength in moments of stress. Endorphins are made in cells throughout our body, mostly our brain and our pituitary, and they have multiple actions. One of the actions of these is to reduce pain. So people who have an endorphin rush really don't feel much pain. Ordinary humans can tap into uh, more strength than we normally have in a, a state where adrenaline and endorphin are running high in the body. We are who we choose to be. Now choose! We have in our brain a tremendous amount of power we never use. But under extreme circumstances, to save a child, to save a friend, our frontal lobe turns off. The frontal lobe inhibits everything. And once that is turned off, then it allows all of these capabilities to come flying out. But super strength and web slinging aren't the only reasons why Spider-Man remains the most popular character to emerge from Marvel Comics. When it comes to snaring villains, Spidey's got other incredible powers. And some aren't as impossible as you might think. And in the comics, Spider-Man often relies on his quick moves to outwit the bad guys, a talent he shares with his eight-legged brothers. In terms of speed, a spider can move very, very fast. They can make movements that look like a blur to us. If you see something that's displacing its own length, you know, like 10 times over in a matter of a split second, then you know it's moving fast. In the first Spider-Man movie, after Peter Parker receives new genetic information from a spider, the transformed team exhibits his lightning-fast moves to save his friend MJ and her lunch from a nasty fall. Wow, great reflexes. But could a human being really move at the speed Spider-Man does? Realistically, we need about 28 microseconds to send a signal from the brain to a muscle. 
after we send the signal to the muscle, the muscle then has to actually be engaged. And then the connective tissue has to be stretched. And then the bones have to be moved. It takes a long time relatively for us to do anything very quickly. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> So what would it take to transform a clumsy kid into a fleet-footed Spider-Man? Could someone really be given a genetic tune-up to make them faster? Humans by no means have the fastest muscles. There are animals that are a lot faster, and it's very reasonable to think that a human could be made faster as well. By altering two proteins, uh, actin and myosin, these act as ratchets which pull the muscle closed, you can make the muscle faster and, and therefore make the person faster. And we have very fast muscles like that in our eyes. It would be like your whole body is made up of muscles that control the eye. Very fast. It is possible that Peter Parker has, in all those cascade of events, from brain, neuron, muscle, connective tissue, bone, that the connections are better and thereby his response to threats and his activities can be done more quickly. How'd you do that? Uh, work out, plenty of rest, you know, eat your green vegetables. That's what my mom is always saying. I just never actually believed her. In terms of his quick maneuvers in the air, Spider-Man's acrobatics through the glass and steel jungles of New York City are in line with real world physics. To rotate or spin a body, you really usually need to apply a torque or force to it. However, as gymnasts and divers know, that you can actually get your body to spin in midair by moving different parts of it in different ways at different times. This is a shot from Spider-Man 3. Um, this is a, a typical swinging shot. And this is an example of how we consider a lot of things about the, um, the strength and the forces. Up top here, he's laying on his back, then he'll kick his legs back here to bring his body forward so that then he's in a position to bring his arm up and shoot the next web, and then the cycle starts again. Spider-Man's powers are amazing, but they come with great responsibility. He learns the hard way that he also has to think as quickly as he moves. We had a tragedy that occurred in Spider-Man's life. The girl he loved at the time, Gwen Stacy, was falling and he wanted to save her. In issue number 121 of The Amazing Spider-Man, Gwen Stacy is hurled from the Brooklyn Bridge by the devilish Green Goblin. He shot his webbing down to catch her he, with the best of intentions. In so doing, when the webbing caught her, her neck snapped and she died. Now he has this bit of guilt to carry with him forever. When he tried to save Gwen Stacy, what Spider-Man chooses to do is grab her with his web, sending it rather quickly, grabbing her leg, and stopping her in a very short amount of time. This is very dangerous because a short amount of time leads to a very large force and snaps her neck. Hand her over! Of course! In the case of Spider-Man saving people who are falling, the key thing you want to do is slow them down over a long time or over a long distance. Just like when you're bungee jumping, the cords stretch over a long time, that makes a smaller force, and that is what helps you not receive damage. Same thing happens with airbags in a car. Instead of suddenly hitting the steering wheel and stopping quickly, you go into the airbag, which stops you slowly over time in a longer distance. In the first Spider-Man movie, our hero makes all the right moves when it comes to catching a damsel in distress. When MJ falls from a balcony in Times Square, Spidey doesn't make the mistake of grabbing her suddenly with his webbing. Instead, our hero dives after MJ, adjusts to her speed of falling, and only then does he use his webbing to stop them from smashing into the sidewalk. In this case, he uses a lot of really good physics, and it's that slowing them down slowly with the stretchiness of the web, just like a bungee jumper does, that really saves them in this situation. But being the coolest superhero on the block isn't always enough to keep Spider-Man one step ahead of the bad guys. Luckily, he's got another talent on his resume, Spider-Sense an intuitive reflex that alerts him to impending danger. Oh. 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 
In a movie, we had a real opportunity to establish what would it look like. Uh, and in movie one, you can see it. It's like all the elements go into slow-mo and it's like a radar system. You see everything and you sort of pinpoint the danger and then it gives you just enough reaction time for a Spider-Man, not for a normal human. Spider-Sense is almost like a, a sixth sense of trouble. It's his way of reflecting that that sixth sense that, that animals in nature have of danger on the horizon, uh, an approaching hurricane, whatever it may be, and he immediately leaps into action. Spider-Man's spidey sense isn't just impressive, it's actually based on an ability many real spiders have. They are very sensitive to vibration and changes in air pressure. And actually, they can feel something coming because of those vibrations. The ones that catch prey in webs, basically they, they feel something hitting the web. The ones on the ground can, can feel things through air movement. They have this trichobothria, which is a really fine hair, and it's kind of a touch at a distance. They can perceive air currents coming in, so if they can feel something approaching through vibration. So it's possible that Spider-Man was endowed with those senses. Maybe that spider sense was something like a uh, uh, touch at a distance, and, and he could feel something happening. Okay, so we've investigated the plausibility of Spider-Man's web-slinging, spider strength, spider speed, and spider sense. But there's one more phenomenal skill known around the world that puts Spidey ahead of the pack, one that seems to defy the laws of gravity, but still has a solid footing in scientific fact. There's nobody here. Only Spider-Man can raise the simple act of just hanging around to high art. Where is she? Which is especially handy outside a criminal's lair. Well, I figured, okay, he could stick to walls, uh, like a spider or any insect, and that would make it fun. But watching Spider-Man's gravity-defying heroics raises a big question. I'm coming! What does Spidey have that the rest of us don't? There are a couple different ways that spiders climb on walls. One is that, that most walls have minute little bumps or fractures. If you take a microscope to a section of it, you can see little ledges or rough spots on it. Spiders have claws on all eight legs, so all eight legs are working. And with the claws that they have, they can grab on the surfaces. But Spider-Man doesn't have claws, so that's not the answer. What he does have is special hair that emerges when needed to, say, get to the top of a building without taking the stairs. Some real spiders have similar hair with a unique property that lets them cling to surfaces as smooth as glass. They have a lot of tiny, tiny, tiny little hairs on their feet, which create electrostatic forces, this field of fluctuating positive and negative charges. This electrostatic connection is known as a van der Waals force, which causes the hairs on a spider's feet to interact with surfaces on a molecular level. And these small hairs really have to get quite small, much smaller than you would normally think, so they can get very close to the atom surfaces and actually develop forces from atomic to atomic interactions. The hairs are very similar to spikes on boots that ice climbers use. The ice boots work because you make holes that you stick in, and the spider hairs are really sticking in between the atomic structure and getting the atoms close enough to each other that they can generate forces that hold them up. But clearly, Spider-Man is much heavier than a real spider too heavy to take advantage of Van der Waals forces. Or is he? 
Believe it or not, scientists are working on a molecular type of Velcro that could solve the problem. Molecular Velcro is a type of material that takes advantage of a lot of the physics that goes on in spiders when they climb. The basic idea is to design extremely small, thin hairs and get enough of them pushed together in a piece of material to hold weights like robots or people that you would want to use in situations where normal adhesives don't work well. A great example of this would be to move along surfaces in space. You could use this molecular Velcro as a way of attaching astronauts to these surfaces to move around with a much greater ease than they move around now. But for Spider-Man to take advantage of his climbing using a system like spiders with very thin hairs, they really have to pierce through his suit. The nice thing is, these hairs are so small, the weave in his suit has plenty of room for them to go through. They would just have to be long enough to reach through his suit. Even today, the abilities of Spider-Man continue to expand with each comic book issue and new movie. In 2007, Spidey's tangled history of genetic mutation took a different spin on movie screens. In Spider-Man 3, an alien organism changes Peter Parker. The gooey, symbiotic life form transforms his suit and his personality. This organism is a symbiote that crashes down to Earth uh, from a meteor that lands uh, from outer space. And it's very much of a parasitic organism. The black suit, the symbiote, makes Peter feel powerful and makes him able to not think about his problems. And so he chooses it. It frightens him, but it has a pull for him and, and he's drawn to it. The alien life form makes Peter Parker become more aggressive. Oh, Spidey, love the new outfit. <laughs> twists his moral sensibilities and begins turning our hero into a villain. What's happening here? Surprisingly, the science behind this transformation is real. The area of the brain that is most responsible for the control of ethical, moral behavior is the orbital cortex. It's right above the eyes. And what's really close to this orbital cortex is the olfactory epithelium. The back of the nose, where you smell, has a connection through the skull right to that region. If you can get a parasite, even sniffing it, could get up into the orbital cortex. It could change the physiology of those cells and therefore change the whole sense of social behavior and morality, aggression, all of these things. It's absolutely possible. So when it comes to scientific reality, it seems that Spider-Man and his powers are within the realm of possibility. It never occurred to me that science would reach the point where there was such a thing as genetic engineering, where science might actually give a human being abilities he or she doesn't possess. Had I known that at the time I was writing Spider-Man, I would have made it even more colorful. The most plausible parts of the whole Spider-Man story is that we can take pieces of DNA into the body, and it can then change the way that cells and organs are expressed. Specific aspects of what happened to Peter Parker. Wow. Those are exciting things that could certainly, I could envision happening in the future. We probably will know a lot about what genes are involved in spinning silk, um, what genes are involved in giving spiders the ability to cling to walls, the ability to leap great distances. But there's a lot more to this legendary superhero than web slinging, spider strength, and wall climbing. What makes Peter Parker a hero to millions around the world isn't just his amazing arsenal of crime fighting skills. Who are you? Your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Spider-Man is so appealing because he's such a human character. He feels the weight of the world, he feels an enormous amount of responsibility, and he's trying to do the right thing. Go get him, Tiger. Everybody can plug in and find a little bit of themselves in Peter Parker, whether it be the bashful, shy nerd from Queens or the hero inside of him waiting to get out. I think everybody sees a little bit of themselves in Spider-Man. Whatever life holds in store for me, I will never forget these words. With great power comes great responsibility. This is my gift, my curse. Who am I? 
I'm Spider-Man.